The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So um, it's nice to take the eight precepts sometimes. I notice that some of you are taking the eight precepts, which is a wonderful thing to do. It is something that goes back all the way to the time of the Buddha. And in the suttas, it always says that uh, uh, just as uh, this is kind of the re reflection you're supposed to do, uh, just as the arahants keep the eight precepts their entire lives, uh, so I will keep the precepts for this one day and night. Uh, yeah, so it's like following in the footsteps of the arahants. That's basically what the Buddha is saying there. Uh, and it's a beautiful way of reflecting on it. Uh, yeah, because it kind of inspires you when you know that you're practicing the same way as all these. Uh, enlightened sages uh, that existed in ancient times uh, and perhaps there are some arahants around even today uh, wouldn't that be cool if there are some arahants in the world uh, kind of nice yeah it lifts you up uh, when you believe and you think that you uh, there still are people practicing to the highest standard even in the present day uh, some in places around the world whether it's uh, you know whether it's even here in australia but uh, in the forest in many of the asian countries in sri lanka thailand myanmar there are always some people who are very special in doing this and now you're following in the footsteps of those people huh? and what a wonderful thing that is uh. and on one particular occasion i remember the uh, buddha was going back and he was visiting his family huh? the sakyans uh, back in kapalavatu huh? yeah and uh, how many of you have been to india huh? Large number, yeah, quite a few of you. Okay, great, good. So he will goes back and visit his family, and then he asked the Sakyans, he asked them, how many of you are keeping the eight precepts? Yeah, on the Uposita days, because that's when you would go to the monastery, that's when you would come to the BSV. Today is the Uposita day, isn't it? So Yeah, I think so. So that's kind of very auspicious. So um, uh, you come, and then you keep the eight precepts on the Uposita days. And then he asked the Sakyans, and then some of them say, they say, some of us keep the eight precepts, uh, some of us don't. Uh, and the Buddha says, that is bad. <laughs> That's what he says, quite literally. You know, on the Uposita day, it is so, such a positive and good thing to do, because you're actually renouncing a little bit. And that aspect of renunciation uh, is one of those things that take you forward on the Buddhist path. Uh, so he says you should always, if you have the opportunity, uh, keep the eight precepts if you can. Uh, so, it's a, so for that reason, it's a, a wonderful thing to do. Uh, and you are kind of adding to your ordinary five precepts and your ordinary morality, uh, but also heading down a little bit the path of renunciation at the same time. Uh, and in Buddhism, renunciation is actually just an aspect of sila. So if you want to uh, practice your sila to the maximum, uh, then a little bit of renunciation sometimes actually is a good thing. Yeah. But don't force it too much. Uh, allow it to come naturally. Uh, allow it to be something that you enjoy. Uh, because whatever we enjoy uh, on the Buddhist path, uh, that is what grows uh, and it becomes uh, something very beautiful and powerful because we enjoy it. If you force yourself too much, uh, then its ability to help you on the path uh, is much diminished. Uh, so, but if you can enjoy it, then it's great. Uh, Actually, that reminds me of another story, uh, because this is also from the sutta. This is, a, I think it's called the Visaka Sutta. I can't remember the names of all of the suttas. There's so many of them, but I think it's called the Visaka Sutta, found in the numerical discourses of the Buddha, the threes, number 70 or something like that. Uh, and in this particular sutta, uh, the uh, Visaka, you know, Visaka was kind of the uh, main, perhaps lay woman follower of the Buddha, and she was very generous and always supporting the Buddha. And sometimes she was com would come to the monastery, uh, and then she would have a conversation with the Buddha. And on this particular day, this was the Uposita day, she would go to the monastery, and she would ask the Buddha, how should we practice the Uposita so that it becomes of great fruit and great benefit? Uh, and then the Buddha gives her kind of three options. Yeah? One option is to, uh, there's some really strange options. Yeah? There must have been some ways that they practice the um, Uposada in those days, uh, but one of them was like, may all beings within this particular area be happy. Uh, forget about the beings outside, but those inside this area, may they be happy. Uh, and the Buddha said, that's the wrong way to practice the Uposada. <laughs> I don't know if anyone actually did that, but it's kind of a strange, it's a limited metta. You only have metta to these people, these are my friends, I will have metta to those, but those outside, I no metta for those, because they are dodgy or whatever. Uh. <laughs> So this was one way, and the other way, bad way of practicing the Uposada day was to sit here, you know, on the eight precepts, uh, and because you're practicing the eight precepts, you think, oh, you kind of really, you kind of want to eat, yeah, and you want to kind of enjoy yourself in the 
afternoon because you can't have any of these things uh, and you sit here all afternoon kind of contemplating all the things you're going to do tomorrow when you're off these blooming precepts yeah oh tomorrow then i'm going to really enjoy myself i'm going to cook a nice meal i'm going to kind of see this entertainment and all this kind of stuff uh, and the buddha said it's the wrong way of practicing the positive yeah. the right way he said and that is uh, to do uh, to have in this particular sutta he mentions having uh, metta the brahma viharas for the whole world uh, but essentially it comes down to meditation practice. Uh, so if you meditate and you become peaceful and calm and you then you are using the precepts in the right way, uh, you're using them as a foundation for something more profound. Uh, and that is the right way of practicing the uposatha. And that is also the right way of uh, uh, hopefully today, uh, yeah, practicing, doing some meditation here today in the same way, in the same kind of theory. Uh. So... Uh, what I will do this morning, it has been labeled as a kind of sutta and meditation retreat, but I always like to start off by talking about meditation a bit generally, just to give you some kind of basis. Uh, I think it's always useful, even though the things I'm going to say are probably things that you've heard before. Uh, I think, generally speaking, you can't really get these instructions too often, uh, because we forget about them. Uh, uh, and some of these basic instructions are really important to be reminded of again and again and again. Uh, I need that myself. It's not as if because I've been a monk for 23 years or whatever, because you, you know these things all the time, sometimes you forget. Uh, so I, it's kind of nice for me to be able to teach others, because it reminds me as well of what I have to do. So it's kind of, it's uh, very useful all around. Uh, you can never have too much of the basic instructions. Uh, people think, they think sometimes they become advanced Buddhists, uh, but really the t instructions are very simple. Uh, the instructions are very easy, uh, and we just need to put them into practice. That is the hardest part. Uh, yeah? If we can do that, then we're going to go a long way. Uh. So uh, what are these basic instructions? Uh, and uh, one of the things that I kind of, my starting point is always uh, the idea that uh, uh, on, in Buddhism, in meditation practice, uh, people often go to the meditation object too quickly. Uh, this is one of the problems. Uh, yeah? and, uh, so, uh, and because you go to the meditation object too quickly, uh, uh, the problem with that, if mindfulness is not already properly established, uh, is that you have to use sometimes a lot of willpower. Uh, yeah, you have to force your mind onto the meditation object. Uh, you have to count the breath. Sometimes people count it forwards and then backwards uh, because forward is not enough force, so you have to count it backwards. Uh, and counting backwards takes a lot of mental activity because you're not used to that. Yeah? So in a sense, it is a way of using force uh, to enable you to follow your meditation object. Uh, I'm not saying that counting meditation or counting your breath necessarily is wrong. Uh, but I'm saying, ideally, you want to withdraw as much of that willpower as possible. And the way to do that is to establish your mindfulness uh, before you go to your meditation object. Uh, and what is um, interesting about this is that this is exactly the way the Buddha speaks in the suttas. Uh, yeah? if you, I always come back to the suttas as the uh, basis for all the inspiration I find on the Buddhist path. Uh, and what the Buddha says in the suttas, uh, Take the, maybe the two main suttas on meditation. Uh, that is the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, and the other one is the Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, and actually, these two suttas are just basically both kind of variations on the same theme. Uh, they're all about Satipatthana practice. Uh. So what does the Buddha say in the Satipatthana Sutta? To take that one first of all. Uh, he says that the way to practice Satipatthana is uh, uh, to do it atapi, uh, yeah, sampajano satima vinaya loka abhijadomanasang. Yeah. And one of the words of those, that, that sequence, that phrase there, one of the words in there is satima. And satima means having mindfulness. Yeah, it's sati, and then the, pre, the suffix ma at the end, which means just having, being endowed with. Yeah. So it means endowed with mindfulness. Yeah. So in other words, the way to do satipatthana practice yeah, is to be endowed with mindfulness from the very beginning. Yeah. This is a quality of the practice that you're doing here. Yeah. And this is why sometimes when we translate uh, uh, words from Pali into English, uh, I, don't know how, I don't know anything about translating into Sinhala or whatever language various people speak here, uh, I used to, but certain, so I can only really uh, talk about English language, but sometimes it is translated as the four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, and that gives the wrong meaning straight away. Uh, because the fa four foundations of mindfulness means uh, that you're using satipatthana to build up mindfulness. Uh, 
That's not what it's about. Uh, you come to Satipatthana with mindfulness established, uh, and then you apply that mindfulness to the four objects, the four Satipatthana objects, yeah, which is the body, feelings, mind, and then uh, Dhamma phenomena or principles or however you want to translate that last one. Uh. So it is more like the application of mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness has already to be established uh, before you can really do Satipatthana practice. Uh. So this is like the first exhibit, yeah, I kind of, this is, I'm, I like to have to prove my point, like a lawyer, so I'm kind of being the lawyer, exhibit number one, Satipatthana Sutta, exhibit number two, Anapanasati Sutta, yeah, what does it say in the Anapanasati Sutta, it says, uh, uh, Satting Parimukkang Upatapetva, huh? yeah, so Satting is e e Pali again, Parimukkang is this word that nobody knows exactly what it means, uh, but it is t uh, said in the commentaries that it means kind of the m around the mouth or the nose, uh, the tip of the nose. Uh, and upatapetva means having established. Uh, having established. In other words, you establish the mindfulness first, uh, then you go on to the meditation object. Uh, yeah? So, satting uh, parimukkang upatapetva, then you go on to watching the breath, then you go on to do the anapanasati proper comes after that. Uh. So this is what you see throughout the suttas, all the suttas that are about meditation practice, uh, always mindfulness established first, uh, then uh, comes the meditation afterwards. Uh. And uh, I would encourage you to try to do that in your own meditation practice, uh, because if you're able to do that, it will tend to be much more easy, much more relaxed, uh, much more uh, free of effort. Uh. It can also be quite frustrating, yeah, because you have to actually wait for mindfulness to arise, and people get often get frustrated in that process. They can't wait. Uh, so they grasp onto the breath and hold onto the breath. Okay, breath, I'm going to really get hold of you now. You don't want to stay here? Well, I'm going to make you stay here. And then, then when you do that, uh, uh, it becomes, uh, unfortunately, it tends to become unpleasant. Uh, but this is often the outcome of these things. Uh. So, uh, please keep that in mind, uh, and uh, there is, of course, the question then is, when is mindfulness established? At what point does that happen? Uh, yeah? This is one of the questions that is very hard to give a precise answer to, and it is something that you will have to experiment a little bit with yourself. Uh, but basically, the idea of mindfulness is the idea that you, have, uh, you are present, uh, yeah? you are here, uh, uh, you are aware of what is happening, uh, around you, you're not kind of lost in thought, you're not kind of thinking about the future and the past, that's the opposite of mindfulness. Uh, you're in the, basically you are aware of what is happening, uh, and you have a degree of clarity of mind. You're not kind of, sometimes you might be s sort of aware, but you have a lot of tiredness or whatever, so you're kind of aware, but not really aware, if you don't know what I mean. This happens to everybody sometimes. Uh, so it is that clarity combined with the ability to uh, be in the present, uh, not just running off into the future and the past. That's really a quite simple idea of what mindfulness is. Uh. Mindfulness is much more than that. Uh. Mindfulness is also about the ability to remember things. Uh. Yeah, the one of the ways it is uh, described in the suttas, it's described as the ability to remember things that you did long ago, uh, that you said long ago. Uh. And these two things are very important, they always come together here, yeah? because of course one of the purposes of Satipatthana or mindfulness practice uh, is precisely to do the right thing, to watch the breath, to remember what you're doing. Yeah? So you are mindful, you are aware of what is happening, yeah? and you also remember what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah? This aspect of things is often called Sampajana, Sampajanya in the Pali Suttas. Yeah? It means that you have clarity about the purpose and the goal of your practice. Yeah? So these two things have to come together. Uh, you are aware uh, and you know what you're doing. Uh, and when those two things come together, then you are practicing meditation. Uh. So how do we get there? And uh, the way to get there is, uh, uh, is described in the, the suttas in, in various ways. Uh, and, uh, but to start off with the very basic things, one of the most fundamental things on the Buddhist path, uh, the very first teaching of the Buddha, uh, and of course the very first teaching of the Buddha is called the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, and in that Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, uh, yeah, in that Sutta, uh, the Buddha says the very first teaching in the very first Sutta is a teaching on the middle way. Uh. Yeah, have you, I guess probably everyone here has heard about the middle way, uh. And it's interesting because almost all Buddhists uh, have heard about the middle way uh, and almost all Buddhists forget to practice the middle way. Uh. 
It's interesting, isn't it? How can kind of we sometimes miss the point? We don't understand exactly what it means or how to apply it in our lives. And one of the things that I have noticed is that the majority of people who practice Buddhist meditation of one kind or another, they tend to go through far too much pain in the meditation practice. And intentionally inflicting pain on yourself, uh, saying, okay, I'm going to endure this pain, I'm going to be mindful of it, uh, I'm going to gain some insight into the pain, yeah, I'm going to really, really get this pain. Uh, that inf purposeful inflection of pain on your body is precisely one of the extremes that we're supposed to avoid. Uh, this is exactly what the Buddha did before his awakening. Uh, he was practicing uh, quite severe austerities. Uh, and when we sit down and we do that, uh, then we are following the wrong path. We're doing what the Buddha said precisely we should not do. The Buddha's awakening was precisely the finding of the middle way uh, and to put these things to one side and put the indulgence in sensual pleasures on the other side away. Uh. So this is so important. Yeah, It comes back to the very foundation of what Buddhist meditation practice is about. And yet so many people forget this. Uh. I'm not suggesting that you should kind of move and change your posture all the time because you have the tiniest bit of pain. Uh, that also is not the right approach uh, because if, if you do that you're going to be moving all the time because always the body is never 100% comfortable. This is the problem with this body. Uh, but what I'm suggesting is that if the pain is persistent uh, and it becomes an obstacle to your peace, uh, it becomes an obstacle to your ability to be mindful, your mind becomes a bit obsessed by it, uh, going back to it all the time, uh, then it is a good time to change your posture. Uh, always remember that uh, the right posture in, for Buddhist meditation is the posture that you can sustain for the period of that meditation. So if you are going to sit for an hour, uh, then sit in the posture that you can sustain for an hour. That is the right posture. The, comfortable that is the posture that is comfortable, that is at ease, when you can feel relaxed uh, and you can feel kind of good about yourself, uh, that is the right posture in Buddhism. Uh, Sitting cross-legged is nice, yeah, it is comfortable to sit cross-legged if you're used to it, uh, but it's not at all a requirement. Uh, it is not the main thing that we're trying to do, even though it says at the beginning of the Anapanasati Sutta that you, sh you, know, you sit down cross-legged. Uh, remember, this is in the context of ancient Indian society, uh, when people were used to these kind of things. Uh, these days, most people are not used to that, uh, and so you do whatever feels right, uh, feels at ease, and feels comfortable for you. Then you are doing the right thing here. Uh. So find that middle way here. Uh, and uh, what is uh, so interesting in many ways about this problem of finding the middle way uh, is that uh, it seems to be a very deeply seated psychological thing in human beings uh, that we think that pain leads to profit, pain leads to some good outcome. Uh. And this goes back, it seems, to kind of ancient times. Uh, there is no first point uh, at which this was not the belief. Everyone seems to have had this belief since going back to yeah, certainly the first kind of written records we have. Uh, and one of those earliest records we have is precisely the Pali Canon, the Buddha Suttas. Uh. And in one of these suttas, a sutta called the Bodhi Raja Kumara Sutta, number 85 of the middle length sayings of the Buddha, Bodhi Raja Kumara, it means Prince Bodhi. This is the Buddha speaking to Prince Bodhi. And uh, in this sutta, Prince Bodhi says to the Buddha, he says that, well, uh, Master or well, blessed one, uh, uh, it is, there, is no, uh, there is no gain without pain. Yeah, you have to have pain. In other words, you have to have austerities. You have to really torture yourself. Then you have gain. Uh, and it is like in the, in the English language, no, uh, no pain, no gain. Yeah, we say that in, in English as well. So this kind of is a very cross-cultural thing. Yeah. And I'm sure you know almost most cultures around the world have some of that same idea, even though they may not have that exact saying. Yeah. That idea is, seems to be lodged in the human mind, regardless of background or culture or whatever we have. Yeah. And then the Buddha replies to Prince Bodhi. He says, well, that's exactly what I thought too before my awakening here. Yeah. Yeah. Here you have the Buddha, the greatest spiritual genius in human history. Yeah. That's my opinion, and I'm sure many of you will agree with that. Yeah. The greatest spiritual master in human history, he also had that wrong view. Yeah. He also thought before his awakening that this idea of no pain, no gain, yeah, exactly the same thing. Yeah. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why he practiced austerities for those six years or whatever it was yeah, before his awakening. Yeah. Yeah, so even the Buddha had this thing. And you can imagine, if even the Buddha, who was kind of the person with the 
uh, strongest spiritual qualities, uh, yeah, the kind of the greatest wisdom, who was able to break through this thing which is so hard to break through on his own without anyone showing him her. That is kind of what makes the Buddha so special. Uh, the fact that you are able to see the reality that, that for most of us is so difficult to attain, uh, he was able to see without, e without anyone else pointing it out to him. Uh, isn't that kind of astonishing? Uh, yeah, I mean, if I usually when I ask in an audience like this how many arahants there are in the audience, uh, I don't usually get many hands coming up. Yeah, the, the pe people don't say me. I, and so it is hard to get the, get to the end of this path. It is difficult, and we are given the teachings on the plate. Here you are, four nikayas. Yeah, read this four nikayas. Uh, I'm not going to ask how many of you have read all the four nikayas or five nikayas because. Uh, but you have, you have some idea of the teachings, yeah? And you don't need to read that much. But here are the teachings. Now practice. And still, it is so difficult. And then comes the Buddha around, and he is able to make this breakthrough on his own, without a teacher. And that is really quite astonishing. And it's almost, in many ways, unbelievable. But um, uh, still, that's what he did. So even he, who had this kind of background, who had this kind of special wisdom, and the special ability, all these qualities that were required to make that breakthrough, he too had the same mistaken idea, which means that it is very deeply lodged in human psychology, and it means that we have to be very careful, uh, because it's very easy to go down that path uh, yeah, and get it wrong. Uh. So uh, watch out for that uh, and make sure that you're comfortable uh, so you can be at ease. And the purpose of this, the reason why you want to be at ease, uh, is because when you are at ease, then usually the body starts to fade into the background. Uh, yeah, the body is not something we want to be in the way of the peace of mind, uh, but usually that's exactly what happens if you have too much pain and suffering in the body. Uh, in exactly the same way, if you have too much pleasure through the body, again, the body becomes important because it gives you some degree of pleasure. The senses, yeah, all of these kind of things give you a degree of pleasure. So by withdrawing both the pain and the pleasure, uh, the body becomes irrelevant. Uh, the five senses start to become irrelevant. Uh, and because they become irrelevant, uh, you don't worry about them anymore, that is where you have the chance to become peaceful inside. Uh, this is why that middle way works and how it works. Uh, it's going beyond the world of the five senses, uh, not finding pleasure and pain there, finding the happiness within instead, the peace within instead. Uh, that is what we're looking for. Uh. So in a sense, you can say that it is not in many ways, not really a middle way. Uh, it is a way of moving away from the physical five sense world and moving on to the world of the mind inside instead. Uh, that is really what that path is all about. Uh. So find, please find that uh, middle way. Uh, and uh, I would say that for most people, I would say if you're going to err, if you're going to make a mistake, uh, it is better to make a mistake on the side of a little bit of indulgence, yeah, rather than on the side of too much pain. Uh, because uh, uh, the point is that if you have a little bit of indulgence, if you have an extra cup of tea, yeah, big deal, uh, yeah, or you kind of lie down a little bit because you kind of you had enough or whatever, uh, um, if you do that, at the very least, you're not going to get fed up with the Buddhist teachings. Uh, if you have, yeah, it's kind of, okay, the Buddha, oh, he was quite compassionate, yeah, I can have an extra cup of tea. Actually, he doesn't say that, but this is kind of me, kind of interpreting, <laughs> interpreting a little bit. Uh, <laughs> and so if you do that, uh, you're going to be able to persevere. Yeah, you're going to be able to keep on practicing the Buddhist path uh, because it is not too harsh. Uh, it is not something that you kind of have a sense of, you know, a revulsion or aversion towards uh, because it is just too difficult and too painful. Uh. So uh, for that reason, I always always better to err a little bit on the side of kind of a little bit of extra indulgence uh, rather than on the side of pain. Because Buddhist teaching, uh, the Buddhist practice, uh, gives results if you can do it in the long term. Uh, yeah, if you keep on practicing sila. Uh, year in, year out, if you keep on trying to do the meditation practice uh, year and year out, year in and year out, uh, that is when it starts to give results. Uh, so if you get discouraged uh, by the problems, uh, you're going to miss out on so much of the benefits of this path and of this practice. Uh. So this is the first thing. It may seem very simple. Uh, it may seem incredibly basic, uh, but it is also so important to get that right. Uh, and when you get that right, then you are already on the kind of right, uh, uh, heading in the right direction. Uh. So what happens then? Well, the next thing that happens then, once you have the body reasonably comfortable and you're focusing on that, uh, is that you also have to be at ease. Uh, yeah, you have to be relaxed. Uh, you have to enjoy 
just sitting here and just sitting down. Uh, you have to let go of some of the tensions and stresses of ordinary life. Uh, they can be felt in the body or they can be felt in the mind. Uh, so you have to kind of allow that to fade in the background. Uh, so please take quite a bit of time in the beginning of your meditation just to uh, first of all be comfortable and then to learn to relax. Yeah, Take your time to relax. Uh, uh, and sometimes it can take quite a while. Uh, yeah, may, I don't know, maybe today because it's early morning you are already quite relaxed, but uh, actually some of you came in cars, yeah, so just driving in a car can be enough to kind of tense you up a little bit uh, with all the traffic in Melbourne. Gee, we, came, we drove back yesterday from uh, that retreat and uh, the traffic is just incredible, uh, just in the middle of the day here. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, so many things in this life that can make you a bit tense and make you a bit kind of unrelaxed and lose that. Uh, kind of balance in your mind. So take time to regain that balance. Take time to regain that ease when you are really just enjoying yourself. You're just sitting here, and the sitting here is a kind of joy in its own right. Uh, and by doing that, you kind of allow everything to kind of settle down. Uh, yeah, the mind is sometimes a bit agitated. Allow things to settle down. Take time to just allow the world to dissipate a little bit, uh, because it take, often takes time. Uh, and all you really have to do to make this happen is just to wait, to be patient. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can be useful, instead of thinking about what you're doing as meditation practice, uh, once you think of something as meditation, it brings up certain associations. Uh, now I've got to watch the breath. Uh, now I've got to be peaceful. Now I've got to force myself this way or that way. Uh, so instead of bringing up all these associations that come with the word meditation practice, uh, sometimes it's better to think yourself, at least initially, as just relaxing. Yeah, you come here to relax. Yeah, relax to the max. <laughs> this was this was one of Ajahn Brahm's sayings. He he told me the story. He went to Korea, and uh, he had and when he went to Korea, they went to the demilitarized zone between North Korea and South Korea. They did some kind of, uh, you know, a little bit of ceremony and meditation to create peace between uh, the two halves of Korea. And uh, he had, there was 6,000 people apparently <laughs> present. Uh, and then he kind of used this mantra, yeah, six, you can imagine 6,000 people saying this, relax. Everybody says, relax. <laughs> then he says, to the max. Everybody says, to the max, yeah. <laughs> It's really quite nice, isn't it? And then, of course, you get the idea, you really relax and you really enjoy yourself. Uh, so please think of that mantra, yeah? So, uh, and then just start off with that, just relaxing, allowing things to become easy, allowing things to be, be relaxed. Uh, and the idea here is, instead of thinking of yourself as a meditator, uh, think yourself as if you are just, you know, like a day when you come back home after work and you're quite tired. Uh, what do you do when you come back from work quite tired? Well, you maybe you sit down in your favorite armchair or something uh, and you just relax. Yeah? You don't do anything at all. You certainly don't try to watch your breath or anything like that. Uh, you just relax. And this is like a little bit of the right kind of attitude uh, when you start out in a meditation. That kind of armchair attitude, yeah? When you're just relaxing, you're allowing your mind to be, you're allowing it to flow, you just feel your tiredness or whatever it is, uh, and you allow things to unwind. Uh, and that is what is happening in that armchair. You are actually allowing things to unwind a little bit. Uh, so start out like that. Uh, and then as things unwind, uh, as things become more kind of... Uh, uh, more peaceful, that's what happens when things unwind, uh, gradually mindfulness comes, starts to arise. Uh, this is where mindfulness comes to be. Mindfulness has so many different qualities and levels, uh, and here you're allowing the mindfulness to arise uh, simply because you are relaxing uh, and you're taking it easy in this particular way. Uh. And what is um, one of the things that uh, so what uh, that we're doing here is keeping it incredibly simple, yeah? Really, really simple. You're not really doing anything at all apart from sitting back and feeling what you feel like and allowing things to unwind. And one of the beautiful things that you find in the suttas, one of the ways that the Buddha explains meditation practice, uh, and I will talk more about this later on because uh, uh, it's actually one of the uh, beautiful suttas that I always like to read out on these kind of retreats, uh, and uh, the Buddha says that this process of meditation cannot be done through an act of willpower. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, he used the word chaitana, and the word chaitana in Pali means will, intention. It means the doing inside of us that kind of makes things happen in the world. Uh, so you have to learn this ability to not do anything, but allow the process to happen. Uh, 
if you have put the causes into place, and I will talk more about those causes later on, but basically it just means living well, if you have put those causes into place, it will happen, and it will happen by, yourself, by itself. And you cannot make the process happen faster by using intention or using willpower. You have to allow it to arise by itself. Yeah, and th there's that nice simile of the, you know, if you want a plant to grow, uh, what you have to do is care for the plant. Uh, yeah, you have to look after it, you have to water it, uh, you have to have the right attitude towards it. Uh, but if you use too much willpower, yeah, if you go over and start pulling the plant so it so grow a bit faster, uh, then you have gone too far and the plant is not going to be too happy if you start pulling on it. Uh, before you know that plant is dead uh, and the plant is no longer going to give any kind of good benefits at all. So don't pull on that plant, uh, don't pull on your mind, uh, allow your mind to kind of grow and come out of this at its own natural pace uh, and then you're doing things in the right way. Uh. So it's supposed to be so easy, yeah? it's supposed to be so relaxing, uh, such a natural process. Uh. So you stand back, you are patient, you allow things to be uh, and this is kind of often the right way. Uh. And then mindfulness starts to arise, mindfulness starts to come out. Uh. and. Uh, when mindfulness starts to come out, uh, there are still going to be uh, a lot, you know, plenty of things that you have to overcome in your meditation. Uh, and, uh, but uh, one of the tricks when mindfulness really starts to come out, uh, one of the attitudes that I would uh, uh, encourage you to develop, uh, but this is only after you have relaxed, yeah? after you feel kind of at ease, uh, you start to have a degree of presence, uh, this is when you can start to contemplate a little bit uh, and you can start to gain the right attitude. Uh, yeah? Only at this point do you start doing these things. It's very important to get the sequence, sequ the sequence roughly right, uh, yeah? otherwise it's not going to work. Uh. And one of the uh, important uh, ways of looking at your life and looking at the spiritual practice uh, uh, that you can use as a kind of uh, perception or an attitude in your meditation practice uh, is to remember what should take priority in life. Uh. What is really important? What is primary and what is secondary? Uh. And so one of the things that you can do is just to remember that this spiritual path uh, is more important than anything else you do in your entire life. Uh, this should always be at the top of the hierarchy. Uh. I was talking to someone yesterday and, uh, uh, who told me that if uh, she had known that you know, what she knows now about the spiritual life, about the Dhamma and about these teachings, uh, she would have rearranged her life completely differently. Uh. Yeah, it was precisely because she didn't really understand, uh, well, she didn't even know the Dhamma at a certain point probably, uh, that she actually got the priorities wrong. Uh. So let's get those priorities right as soon as possible. Uh. And once you have your priorities right, it means you put the Dhamma first, uh, Dhamma first and then everything else in life is secondary. Uh. And uh, this is so important and I will, the these days it is so common to hear about mindfulness practice, they use mindfulness practice around the world, uh, to help people with treat mental problems, to help people make more profit in their corporations. Uh, is that good? Huh? It's okay, yeah, it's okay. If, if, if people are happy and the corporations make more money, as long as you're not purely exploiting people, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, sometimes they use mindfulness in the military, that's, that's where it gets a bit more dodgy, yeah, using kind of <laughs> Buddhist principles to, to kill people, I'm so, not so sure about that. Uh, but um, uh, Anyway, the problem is that with so much of what we call the secular uh, mindfulness practice uh, uh, is that it is used for an ulterior motive. Uh, the purpose of the mindfulness in almost all secular context is to actually achieve something else. Uh, mindfulness is a tool to achieve some other worldly aim. Uh, and that other worldly aim is to have better relationships, uh, that other worldly aim is to perform better at work, uh, that other worldly aim is to you know, be able to be more effective in war. Uh, it is always something else, something that has to do with our ordinary life. Uh. And the majority of people are just like that. Uh, we practice a bit of meditation uh, to have a better family life, we practice a bit of meditation again to, you know, to generally improve the quality of life that we have outside and elsewhere. Uh. And if that is the attitude that you have, uh, what it means is that your priority is your worldly life, uh, yeah, because that is at the top. And then uh, the spiritual aspect, the, s the mindfulness or whatever else that we do, is there to support the other thing, which actually is more important. Uh. 
And what happens when we have that attitude uh, is that when you sit down and you meditate uh, and it gets a bit boring or you, know, you, you don't really kind of, you can't really watch the breath or whatever and it doesn't really work, then because your priority is these other things, uh, you're going to start thinking about them. Uh, you're going to st start thinking about that important, uh, you know, the, the, the problems in your life and the kind of things that you have to solve at work. Uh, and there is endless problems. Uh, just, you know, this is one of the, again, one of those important insights, uh, is that because there are endless problems, uh, if you think about them, you're going to be thinking forever, because there's always going to be another problem behind that one. Uh, so you're always going to be thinking, don't think. This is the problem. Don't think that when you solve this one thing, it will be okay. It won't be okay. There's always another problem waiting behind it. Uh, and that's why if you use time in meditation to solve problems, uh, it's going to go on forever. You're never going to get there. Uh. So rearrange things. Uh, yeah? If uh, your worldly life is more important, uh, you're always going to come back thinking about that in the meditation practice. Uh, the only way you're going to be able to stop thinking about your worldly life uh, is to reprioritize things. Uh, put the spiritual life on top uh, and remember that everything you do in your ordinary worldly life, your family, your work, uh, whatever it is that you do, actually is there to support what you're doing now. Uh. And once you understand that, that all of those other things are there to support what you're doing now, uh, it means that there's no point in thinking about them. Because now you have got to what you're really supposed to be doing, all that other stuff is to support this, uh, so why on earth are you going to think about it? Uh, yeah, you have finally arrived at, a at some kind of destination. Uh, you're not going to think about all the journey that got you here, because uh, that's become irrelevant. Now you're going to enjoy the destination and make the most of it. Uh. Because you have your priorities the right way around, uh, it means that your attitude to what you're doing changes dramatically as a consequence. Uh. So uh, remember that. And when you remember that, it transforms the way your meditation works. Uh. It also transforms the way you tend to think about your ordinary life. Uh, you integrate your ordinary life into the spiritual path. Uh, you know that how you work, how you live your family life, all of these things uh, matter enormously for your spiritual practice. Uh, if you get your family life, your work life, and all of those things right, uh, it will be an incredibly su credible support uh, for your meditation practice. Uh, yeah, Because you got your priorities right. Uh, and this doesn't mean that you become a callous person who do doesn't care about your family or your work colleagues or anything like that. Uh, actually, quite the contrary. Uh, it means that because you reprioritize uh, and because you understand that all the rest of life also has a spiritual purpose and a spiritual significance, uh, you become better at living your ordinary life. Uh, you give it more metta, you give it more care, more compassion, more kindness, uh, more of all of these things. Uh, yes. Uh, so actually, you get that m greater integration in both your spiritual life uh, and the rest of your life improves as a consequence. Uh, that is the magic with this. Uh, both things come together. Uh, so it's extraordinarily powerful in this way. Uh. So remember that. Remember your priorities. Uh, remember what really matters in life. Remember where real satisfaction is to be found at the end of the day. Uh, yeah? And when you remember that, then uh, uh, you, the whole attitude to this starts to change. Uh. So this is one way of helping you, once you have a degree of clarity of mind, uh, this is one kind of perception uh, that can help you to uh, stabilize the mind in the present moment uh, and not allow it to run around too much into all kinds of fantasies and weird stuff, uh, but bring it back to the present moment instead. Uh, uh, so as the mindfulness improves, uh, yeah, you have that uh, nice little verse in the Bad Ekarata Sutta, uh, middle length sayings number 131, uh, a very beautiful verse that the Buddha says has to do with the foundations of the spiritual life. Uh, and in that verse the Buddha says that uh, you should not run back into the past because the past has gone. You should not run to the future because the future hasn't arrived yet. Uh, instead, you should see with clarity into the presently arisen phenomena. Pachudamma, pachu, uh, pachupanna dhamma, the presently arisen phenomena. Uh, yeah, it's a very famous verse that probably many of you, especially if you have a Buddhist background, uh, you will have heard that because it is one of those uh, fundamental teachings in the suttas. Uh. Yeah, so the idea is to see with clarity into the presently arisen phenomena, and that is what mindfulness is all about. Uh. So you shouldn't run into the past, uh, you shouldn't run into the future. Uh. So how, when the mind still does that, uh, how can we avoid the mind, stop the mind from running into the past and running into the future? Yeah. 
And I've already given you one example of how to do that using this idea of prioritizing your life in the right way, uh, making sure that the spirituality comes at the top uh, and then everything else is kind of subsumed, if you like, under that, uh, yeah, comes as part of that. Uh, but uh, there's much more to be said about that, how to give up the past and the future. Uh. It is easy to say that we should give up the past and the future, but sometimes it is hard to do. Uh. So what are some skillful means in helping us to give up the past and the future? Uh. And uh, for the past, uh, the past very often, the reason why the past is sticky uh, and the reason why we can't let go of the past, uh, very often it has to do with uh, things, with people, yeah? especially uh, people we may have some kind of problem with somebody and then we think back into the past and we want to resolve maybe certain issues that have happened, maybe there were some in unskillful actions, maybe on maybe on your own behalf or maybe someone else towards you, whatever, whatever it was. Uh, and this is very often the problems of the past. We think about things that happened in this way. Uh. And of course the answer to dealing with that is always to forgive. Uh. Yeah, to let go of that and to forgive other people. Uh. And uh, I will just mention one very simple way of uh, doing forgiveness. Uh, because again, it's easy to say that we should forgive, but actually doing forgiveness is much more difficult. Yeah? You must forgive, okay, but how do you do it? Uh, and uh, one way to forgive, which, is very, which I uh, always try to use in my own practice, uh, is the idea, the simile of the red light, the simile of the traffic light. Uh, I mentioned that yesterday here, as I mentioned it all the time probably, but uh, simile of the traffic light. Yeah? So what happens? If, let's say that you are really busy, you are hurrying along, uh, you run, get into your car, you drive off, you drive off, you're going off to this meeting somewhere, something very important, you've got to get there on time, you're a little bit late already, and as you get into the car, you come around the corner, traffic light just goes red, just as you approach it, yeah? And so what is your reaction to that traffic light? Uh, you can either get really angry, uh, yeah, and you can yell at that traffic light and say, you terrible traffic light, you knew I was coming around the corner and you got r red just as I was coming around the corner. You are evil to the core traffic light. Uh, and then you can get out of your car and you can give that traffic light a good shake because you're really angry with it. Uh, and then you get put into a mental asylum soon afterwards. Uh. <laughs> <coughs> so this, <coughs> this is the problem. We realize how absurd it is. Yeah? It's really crazy. But <coughs> but the point is, and this is kind of the point of the simile, is that people are like traffic lights. Yeah, people are just like the traffic light. Basically, runs on a kind of on a circuitry on a certain program, and it goes red every few minutes. And it's madness to get too angry with it. You might get a bit upset, but you don't really get angry with the traffic light. In the same way. People are just like that. Uh, people are like traffic lights. Uh, and it's so easy to underestimate the degree to which we are conditioned as human beings. Uh, yeah, it is very easy to think, and the reason why it is hard to see that is because uh, it feels like we are these autonomous agents. Uh, we are agents who can decide what we want to do. We can go this way and that way. Uh, but the more you look at yourself, the more you understand your psychology, uh, and especially if you were able to look into your past lives and see how you character traits carry on from one life to the next one, uh, the more you understand that, uh, the more you realize actually we're not very auto at autonomous at all. Uh, we're pretty much programmed to be the way we are. Uh, it's a deep program which lies inside of us, uh, written a long time in the past, uh, and now we are railroaded. Yeah? We're on these tracks, uh, and we can't get off these tracks. Uh, like a, you know, like a like something with great momentum moving forward in a certain direction and that momentum is the momentum of past habits uh, and we can't really get out of them. Uh. So remember that uh, and remember that when other people and uh, there are, you know, things happen in your life which are unfortunate or whatever, uh, remember that this is what is going on. Uh. People being a bit like robots, uh, people being programmed to do certain things, uh, you being programmed to do certain things. Uh, and the more you understand that, uh, that people are not really doing these things because they want to harm you. Uh, people know that kindness is good. Uh, yeah, people know that kindness leads to happiness in the world. We all know that. Uh, yeah, I think even people who are evil somehow know that, but they somehow get, si get sidetracked. Uh, 
Yeah, we know that, and yet somehow we can't stop ourselves sometimes from thinking the wrong thing, doing the wrong action. Why? Because the habits in us are so strong. We are so conditioned. We actually have to do those things, even though we know we shouldn't be doing it. And it's kind of sad in a sense, yeah, that that has to be the case. But that is also where the ability to have compassion arises. So remember that. Yeah, remember how people do things, not so much out of free will, but because of conditioning. And then you can have compassion for them. Then you can forgive. Then you can let go. And then the past stops to bother you in your meditation practice. The past is gone. So. These are ideas, these are ways of reflecting. Yeah? So you reflect like that and then in your meditation practice say that some kind of memory of the past comes up. And sometimes it does, yeah? sometimes it just interferes in your meditation practice. So if you are quick and you catch it early on, then uh, you just bring up that idea of forgiveness, reminding yourself of the simile of the red light. And if you catch yourself quick enough, and this is what some of the, one of the benefits of doing meditation practice, uh, that you already have a degree of mindfulness, uh, so you're able to catch yourself more quickly. Uh, bring up that perception, and bang, the problem is gone very, very quickly. Uh, that is the ideal way yeah, of dealing with uh, these uh, negative emotions when they arise in this way. Uh, and uh, just to be clear, I'm taking these things pretty much from the suttas. Yeah? The Buddha again gave these kind of explanations. So actually, there's a sutta with Venerable Sariputta where he talks a lot about how to give, uh, get rid of uh, resentment from the past. Uh, and this is the kind of way that he, he recommends doing this. Uh. So, very useful. So, try out this idea of forgiveness to get, get rid of things from the past. Yeah? Of course, the ideal way is to live really, really well. And when you live really, really well, you don't have many things to regret. And because you haven't got many things to regret, there isn't really any problem there. There's nothing really to forgive. And then you can just carry on in the right way. So what about the future then? That's the past. How do we deal with the future? And um, Again, this is kind of similar to what I was talking about before, about the uh, make giving priorities uh, to things, giving priorities to uh, the spiritual path. Uh, but you can make that a bit more nuanced. There are different ways of uh, doing this. Uh, and uh, one of the ways of uh, thinking about the future is always to remind yourself how incredibly uncertain it is, uh, yeah? how out of control it is. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, and because you don't know what's going to happen next, uh, it is really a complete waste of time to think about it. Uh, because we think about it because we want to control it. Uh, yeah? We want to kind of make it be this way, we want to make it be that way. But actually, you can never control the future anyway. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, you might die before you, you know, before you get out of this room. Uh, and then you have spent all that time thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow. W was it a waste or not? It was a complete waste of time. Yeah? Uh, and this is kind of the thing about the future. It is so uncertain. Huh? And notice that. Notice how uncertain it is. And uh, uh, you, all you have to do is to kind of you know, think, think about all the things in your life that happen that upset you. Huh? Every time something upsets you in life, uh, it's because somehow things haven't worked out the way you want them to work out. Uh, everything you see something, somebody does something. Uh, 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 of course, the big things like people getting sick and dying, of course, is a very big one. Uh, but also the small things in life that always go the wrong way, not the way you want them to do. Uh, future is always so utterly unreliable. There's nothing there really to hold on, hold on to. Uh, and uh, the future, the world around us is always disintegrating, uh, always falling apart. Uh, we try to prop it up to our best of our abilities, but uh, you know, still it doesn't really work. Uh, and because it is always disintegrating, always falling apart, uh, it is good to remember that. This is what anicca, what unreliability and impermanence is all about. Uh, you are, it, things are out of control and ultimately things will always let you down. Uh, why think about that world that will always let you down? Uh, when you think about the future, uh, you're not sitting there thinking about your future meditations, right? Uh, you're thinking about other things. Uh, Okay, if you think about your future meditations, then it's pre not so bad, yeah? Then it's pretty okay, but I've never heard of anyone sitting in meditation thinking about the future kind of meditation and the your samadhi and all these kind of things. What you think about is other stuff, usually. Yeah. So, uh, and all of that, most of that stuff that you have to do with the future is so utterly unreliable and uncertain. Uh, it is, you know, right now, it, the world is kind of crumbling in certain ways, yeah? And uh, because the world is crumbling, it always goes against our wishes. Uh, 
Uh, just forget about that whole world. It's irrelevant. Uh, it is out of control. It is always going to let you down. Uh, why worry about that world, uh, which is never going to give you any happiness? Uh, and at the end of the day, you have to leave it all behind anyway. When you pass away, uh, let it go. Uh. And one of the little perceptions that I sometimes use in this connection, just to kind of make it very clear to myself, uh, is to remind myself that I have no future. Uh. Yeah, the future, the, I have absolutely no future. Why? Because that future I might think is there is just too unreliable to really rely on her. I, might, I may not be here tomorrow. If I'm not here tomorrow, well, uh, one day it's going to be like that. One day I will not be here tomorrow. Uh, this is like using the death uh, contemplation to remind yourself that thinking about the future is completely crazy. Uh, yeah, one day I will not be here tomorrow. That day, when is that day going to be? You don't know. So the only time you can be ready is now. Now you have to be ready. So if you are ready now, it means you have no future. Let go of the future, stay in the present moment. Uh. So try that little mantra. If you find yourself thinking about all kinds of worldly things, uh, remind yourself that really, in one way, in a very profound sense, uh, you have no future. Uh. Yeah? Eventually all of this is going to have to go. It can happen much sooner than you think. Uh. Now is the time to let it go. Uh. And in this way, you can slowly, gradually learn how to let go of the future. Uh. Many of these things that I am talking about now, these are ways of looking at the world. They are like contemplations or reflections, a way of dealing with, uh, 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 dealing with problems. Uh, and because they are contemplations and reflections, and because it takes a while to establish these things, uh, it is often useful to think about these things, yeah? Either uh, sometimes during meditation uh, or during a kind of a mini retreat or in daily life or whatever. And as you reflect on these ideas, uh, yeah, uh, then they start to gain a certain power. Uh, and once they have a certain power, then your ability to use these ideas uh, in your meditation practice is enhanced enormously as a consequence of that. Uh. So don't just think of these things as something that you kind of, you know, you, you hear once and then you're finished with it. Uh, you have to develop these ideas. If, you, if they make sense to you, uh, and I hope they do, if they don't make sense to you, well then it's not going to be possible for you to develop them, but if they make sense to you, then try to develop these ideas and then they become sources uh, that you can use in the future to empower your meditation practice. Uh, yeah, and then they become very useful. Uh. And of course, as you do this, uh, as you, um, uh, as you uh, establish, uh, think about the future and the past in this way, uh, of course, mindfulness becomes even more powerful. Uh, yeah? No, you leave that baggage behind uh, and you start to come into the present moment in a very powerful way. Uh, and this is exactly what that Bad Eka Ratta Sutta is all about. Majjhima Nikaya 131 uh, is all about. This idea of emerging into the present moment and then seeing uh, the uh, presently arisen phenomena, the Pachupanna Dhamma. Pachupanna means the present in Pali. Uh. So that is uh, how mindfulness comes about. And that gradually that mindfulness becomes stronger and stronger. And eventually, during this whole practice, uh, there comes a point when it becomes almost automatic to watch your meditation object. Yeah? Uh, and uh, you start watching the breath, and it may be that you have started a little bit already, and then you deal with a bit more with the past and the future. Yeah? There is no exact sequence here. It's not one thing coming exactly the after the other. You have to experiment a little bit for yourself. Uh, but there comes a point when you have enough clarity that you can start watching the breath, for example. If you like to do anapanasati, that happens then at that point, when the mindfulness has been established. And then you continue in the same way. When you have enough mindfulness to watch the breath, you continue in the same way. And if there are intruding thoughts as you go along with watching the breath, you can use the similar kind of technique to let go of those thoughts and let go of those perceptions. As you, as you practice in this way. Yeah. So this is already now, you're doing really well. If you can do that much, congratulations. Yeah? You're already doing incredibly well, you're on the right path, you have some idea of mindfulness uh, and you're kind of heading in the right way already. Yeah. But there's one more ingredient to all of this that is missing here. Yeah. And that last ingredient is the one that is gonna really propel you forward on the path in a very powerful way. Yeah. And that is the ingredient of joy or happiness in the practice. Uh, yeah, to enable you to bring in some of that gladness of the mind, the rapture of the mind. Uh, if you can do that, it really empowers the meditation enormously. Uh. And the reason why it empowers the meditation is because uh, 
if you are enjoying what you're doing, it is so much easier to be mindful. Yeah? Make the present moment the pleasant moment. Uh, another of Ajahn Brahm saying, he has all these kind of nice catchwords that are really nice. Uh, make the present moment the pleasant moment. When the present moment becomes the pleasant moment, uh, wow, the present moment is so delightful. You don't want to be in the future, you don't want to be in the past. All you want to do is to be right here, right now. Uh, not only does it make you come into the present, uh, but if you see that happiness and you see that joy or whatever it is that you have uh, and you see that combined with your meditation object uh, so that your breath actually starts to look beautiful, uh, your breath starts to look nice, uh, yeah, uh, then of course it also becomes easy to become still. Not only do you have mindfulness but you also have the ability to watch the meditation object. Uh, why? Because the meditation object appears beautiful, it appears nice, it appears attractive. You can't stop yourself from going there because the meditation object is actually draws you in by the power of the good qualities that it has. So the question then is, how can we give rise to that joy in our meditation? And the answer is that uh, uh, often it happens pretty much automatically. Yeah, you go along, you're watching your breath, you're just, or you're just allowing yourself to be peaceful. Sometimes you don't even have to watch the breath, the joy comes anyway, even if you're not watching the breath. And uh, uh, you just allow this process to happen. And as you abide in the emptiness, abide in the stillness, or you abide with watching the breath, there comes a point when joy suddenly starts bubbling up by itself. This is kind of the easy way, yeah? It just happens whoo, as an automatic process. Uh, the joy comes and off you are. And now you're really, uh, you don't really need much more uh, information about what to do after that. Actually, still, you need a little bit of information about where things go so you can kind of monitor yourself, but then you are on the highway to samadhi already if you have that joy happening uh, inside of you. Uh. So, uh, but it doesn't always uh, come automatically. Uh. So if it doesn't come automatically, sometimes we need to nudge the mind a little bit. I use the word nudge on purpose because you don't want to use willpower, especially not at this state in, in, stage in your meditation. If you use willpower at this stage, very often the whole thing just comes crashing down. Yeah? You start thinking too much, you start trying too much, and then all the stillness you had is kind of gone before you know it. So what you have to do, you have to be very gentle with yourself. And it's almost almost like having a memory of a certain perception, a memory of a certain way of looking at the world. Uh, and you kind of bring that kind of feeling almost up into the mind. It's almost like a feeling, uh, not really so much thinking. Uh, and with that feeling, with that perception, then the joy can arise. Uh, what is that feeling? Uh, and one, uh, what is that perception? And one of the perceptions that I was just reading out on the retreat, uh, that we just finished down in Anglesey, uh, is the idea of Kalyanamitta. Uh, yeah, the idea that you are here in the BSV, uh, Buddhist Society of Victoria, uh, yeah, in a far away corner of the world, uh, far away from traditional Buddhism. Uh, actually, I come from Perth, I shouldn't say anything about being far away in the corner of the world. That's really far away in the corner of the world. Uh, uh, but uh, far away from traditional Buddhism, yeah, and still, yet despite that, we have these wonderful Buddhist societies that are growing up, uh, and you have all these people around you who are practicing the same way. Uh, how fortunate you are. If you had come to Australia 50 years ago, there would be nothing like this. Uh, well, actually, the Buddhist society here existed already, but it was very different from what it is now. If you had come here 70 years ago, the Buddhist society here wouldn't, wouldn't exist, uh, yeah? There would be nothing here. So you have these Kalyanamittas. Uh, you have come in a lifetime when you have been somehow conditioned to be a Buddhist. Uh, yeah? You have the ability to, uh, to practice these beautiful, wonderful teachings uh, that give life meaning, that give life purpose, uh, that kind of makes all the difference. Uh, and you should just be so grateful for having these Kalanamittas around you. Uh, you have, sometimes you have good monastics also who help out. Uh, you have the, all your friends here. You have the Buddha behind it all, yeah, reading the suttas, knowing what, what he has to do. You have these beautiful facilities coming up everywhere. Uh, wow, well how fortunate I am to be part of this. Uh, and just by rejoicing and having good people around you, a sense of being part of a group of wonderful people. Uh, and remember that, everyone who comes here is wonderful. Uh, yeah, whatever arguments or disagreements you may have had in the past is nothing uh, because everyone here comes to practice kindness, uh, to practice goodness, to do something good in the world. Uh, and what a wonderful thing it is that people have this kind of intention. Uh, everyone here is a wholesome kind of person. Uh, so rejoice in that. Uh, these are your Kalyanamittas. Uh, 
These are your friends in the spiritual life. Uh, and that kind of attitude gives rise to so much, uh, can give rise to joy in the practice, uh, remembering all of that. Uh. And that kind of attitude also incorporates a little bit of the other anusatis, the so-called recollections or reflections that we do in Buddhism. Yeah, because Kalanamittas may also include the Sangha, it may include the Buddha, yeah, the Buddha Anusati. So kind of bringing all of those things together into one kind of thing, yeah, the Kalyanamitta Anusati. Yeah. That word doesn't exist, yeah, I just made it up, but it's kind of, but it's kind of nice word, yeah, Kalyanamitta Anusati, recollection of the Kalyanamittas. Yeah. So now I'm going to write my own sub-commentary maybe on the, you have, you have to invent something new, yes? Yeah? So, Kalyanamitta Anusati. I, I don't think anyone has said that before. Okay, I have to be, don't, okay, don't let pride arise in me. <laughs> so, uh, so, this is one way of giving rise to that idea of kind of wholesome joy. Yeah? Uh, more uh, other ways of doing it is to uh, bring up a little bit of metta at this stage, uh, the kind of the uh, loving kindness yeah, for the people around you, wishing people well. Uh, if it doesn't kind of take off, uh, you can do a bit of metta practice uh, and you can kind of conjoin that with uh, anapanasati. Uh, if at a certain point things don't work, uh, do a bit of metta and then come back to the breath later on again. Uh, yeah? But do a very gentle kind of metta. Don't use too much force again because it will take you away. Just spread that kindness to all the directions uh, and see what happens as a consequence. Uh. So that is one way, another way of giving rise to joy. Uh. Another way is to uh, reflect on something you have done in your life in the past uh, that gave you a lot of happiness and joy. Uh. And I think we all have done things in our life that we feel really kind of happy about, uh, not proud about, not conceited about, not having a big ego about, uh, but things that we feel really, wow, that was a good thing to do. Uh, I really, uh, that, that was a good quality in me. I did, that, I did, the, did the right thing. Uh, an act of generosity, an act of kindness towards someone else. Uh, and you can just bring that to mind very gently uh, and just feel that feeling that you had then when you felt good about yourself. Uh, and when you bring that feeling again back to the surface, uh, it can bring back that joy and happiness uh, that you had a long time in the past. Uh. And this is called uh, in the suttas, again, I'm just quoting the suttas here. This is called Chaganusati, a recollection of generosity, or Silanusati, the recollection of your good character, or the re recollection of morality, if you like. Yeah. So you, it's interesting, these things are often mentioned in the suttas, uh, but uh, uh, you have to kind of grasp them in the right way, understand them in the right way, for them to have power in your meditation practice. Uh. So this is how you can hopefully get some joy arising in your meditation yeah, by, by doing that. Very often it just happens automatically. Yeah. And when you get there, well then you are doing incredibly well in your meditation, you're really going to be enjoying yourself. Uh, and when the day's retreat is over, you don't want to leave, you're going to hang out here all night long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's true. One of, the, one of the people, I don't know if he's here today, maybe he's not here today, he came on the retreat. Uh, and his meditation was so good, yeah, at this retreat. He enjoyed himself so much. He said to me when he went back to sleep, there's no way he could fall asleep. He got out again and continued meditating into the night, yeah, because he got this incredible boost of energy, of joy and happiness from his meditation. It's always nice to hear that. You hear people getting powerful meditation practice on retreats or whatever, and it's such a joyful thing when people get some really good results out of this. So, that is a, uh, <laughs> quite a bit about meditation, quite a lot. Uh, so, remember, uh, most important are the basic things that I started out with. Uh, start off by relaxing, just enjoying yourself, just having a good time, uh, and allow the process to come as automatically as it can. Uh, and if you do that, you are going to uh, enjoy today. Uh, and if you come back tomorrow, hopefully enjoy tomorrow as well. Uh, and then the whole thing will kind of hopefully come together for you. Uh. I've been talking for an hour already, uh, an hour goes faster, and uh, I don't really want to say much more anyway, so it's kind of suitable, uh, kind of good place to stop. Uh. So keep on, uh, uh, just uh, practice gently and kindly, have a lot of kindness and compassion for yourself uh, and for everyone else at the same time, uh, and then uh, hopefully the day will unfold in a nice way. Uh.